Welcome to this Easter Sunday service. Whether you are a St Peter's Barge regular or you are joining us for the first time, you are very, very welcome. There is our service sheet available on the St Peter's Barge website. Um, so do go to there if you want to download it. You just click on the Easter services graphic on the home page and it's available there. The younger ones, as usual, have had their Sunday school already this morning on Zoom. Uh, so when we get to the Bible teaching bit in the service now, uh, that's pitched a little bit more at the grown-ups. I'm sure your parents already have something to hand for you to be doing when we get to that so that they can listen. Now, as usual, we're going to say hello to our good friend, uh, Sean the Sheep. Uh, so, Sean, if you can come and join me now, that would be great. Oh, here he is. How are you doing, Sean? OK, I guess. Good, good. Um, it's hard not being able to hang out with my friends. Oh, I get that completely. It's really hard. But it's great to have you with us today. And how about a little Easter quiz to cheer you up? Would that be good? Ooh. OK, I've got a few questions for you. How do you feel if your tummy is empty? I feel sad. OK, you feel sad. How do you feel if your piggy bank is empty? Sad then as well. OK. How do you feel if your life is empty? Really sad then. OK, so my Easter question for you is this. Jesus was buried in a tomb on Good Friday and then on Easter Sunday morning the tomb was found to be empty. So how does that make you feel? Oh, I get it. It's a trick question, isn't it? I'm not sad about that being empty. I'm glad. Well, why is that then? Why is the tomb being empty good news? Because it means Jesus was raised to life. That's it. You've got it in one. And that's why today is a celebration. Oh, hold on a minute. Oh, OK, Sean. Um, we're kind of live here, so we've got people watching. Um, hold on, hold need, on. You need to come back fairly soon, Sean. This is going to be embarrassing. Um, OK, hold on. Sean is... Uh, here he comes. I. Oh, hold on. So, Sean, thank you for rejoining us. What What's going on here? Ta-da! Uh, Sean, now that is a... That's a really smart outfit. What is this? Well, given today's a celebration that Jesus is risen, I thought I'd put my best party shirt on. I absolutely love it. Thank you for dressing up for our party today, our celebration. Shall we pray together as we begin? Okay. Okay, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the wonderful news of Easter Sunday, that Christ is risen from the dead, that death has been conquered, Please, by your spirit and through your word, fill us with joy and peace and hope in believing as we meet in the name of the risen King. Amen. Well, he lives. Christ is risen from the dead. We're going to sing together now. OK, Sean, thanks for being with us. Bye, everybody.
just sung of God's salvation plan, wrought in love, born in pain, paid in sacrifice. On Good Friday we were remembering the sacrifice of Jesus in our place, taking the judgment that we deserve. And we're going to acknowledge now our need of that sacrifice as we confess to God ways in which we have failed to live as we should. So together we pray. Most merciful Father, our Creator and Judge, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart and we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We earnestly repent and are truly sorry for all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us and strengthen us to serve and obey you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen to these words of assurance. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, to him be the glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. We give thanks now in song for that blood of Jesus which washes away our sins. Jesus 
from Luke chapter 23 starting at verse 15. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone, where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women had come down with him from Galilee, followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marvelling at what had happened.
We began our Good Friday service with the grim figure of 75,000. That was the number of global deaths from the coronavirus. It's now 95,000. It's gone up by 20,000 just over a couple of days. And in the UK, we've had our first day this past week with over 900 deaths. One thing you can't get away from at the moment is death. Uh, we're really having our faces rubbed in it, aren't we? Um, now, of course, before all this started, people were still dying every day, 1,500 deaths a day in the UK. But it was just happening quietly, behind the scenes, not reported, not talked about, hushed up. It's now headline news, and we're very aware of it. A church pastor called Francis Grimke was uh, preaching a sermon on November the 3rd, 1918, in Washington, D.C. And this was at the height of the Spanish flu epidemic. And he said this, as the papers came out day after day, among the first things that everyone looked for or asked about was the number of deaths. And so the thought of death was never allowed to stay very, very long out of the consciousness of the living. Well, although what we're experiencing is nothing like uh, on the scale of that epi epidemic, the, the same is true, isn't it? That death is on our minds. And it feels quite close, doesn't it? Um, I mean, even if you're not high risk, you can't help but thinking, well, if, if Boris ended up in intensive care, surely none of us is safe. This virus is no respecter of persons, of position or of privilege. If even Boris can't be protected from this, who can? And with no vaccine, we feel helpless. People speak, don't they, about the fight against the virus and at some point we will win the battle and things will return to normal. But let's not forget that death is not going to go away. He'll still be there, still be waiting, watching, biding his time, even if he's no longer headline news. And so with death in the headlines and death in our minds, it makes today all the more relevant because Easter Sunday is about the defeat of death, about victory over death, about a solution to death. And if that doesn't make us sit up and take note, something is wrong. I wonder what you do when you get marketing calls um, coming through on your phone. My standard line is, thank you very much indeed, but I'm afraid we don't take marketing calls. And I hang up, I do it politely but firmly. And the reason I do that is that I'm pretty certain that whatever they happen to be offering is not anything I'm going to want or need anytime soon. But this is different. A solution to death is a call we should be taking and listening carefully to. Jesus Christ said, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. It's recorded in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 to 18. This is what the risen, exalted Jesus said to the Apostle John in a vision. 
when John was in exile on the island of Patmos. Extraordinary words. Fear not, Jesus said, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Firstly, Jesus tells us what happened to him. He says, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. At the heart of Christianity are two events on one weekend in the first century, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross to pay for our wrongdoing on the Friday and his resurrection to life on the Sunday. And those two events are at the heart of the Christian faith. Christians have chosen as their central symbol the cross. So what the golden arches are to McDonald's, uh, what the swoosh is to Nike, so the cross is to Christianity. It's what you find sitting on tops of churches or hanging on silver chains around people's necks or tattooed on their skin. But it would be a mistake to dismiss the resurrection of Jesus as a sideshow. The death and the resurrection of Jesus go together. And so if you're going to have a symbol, this is actually the sort of cross uh, that I prefer. So it's a, it was made in a, a special needs workshop uh, in Austria. And I just love the way that it combines, it links the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, so next time you go past a cross in a church building, drill a hole through it. Jesus says, I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Jesus died and he is now alive because he was raised to life. And he really was. So his resurrection on the Sunday was as historical and real as his crucifixion on the Friday. If you'd been there on the Friday, you could have rubbed your hand on the cross and you would have got a splinter from it. And if you'd been there on the Sunday, you could have gone into the tomb and seen that it was empty. All that was left were the grave clothes in which Jesus had been buried, lying there undisturbed, his body having passed through them. The empty tomb is the first bit of evidence. The second is his resurrection appearances. That over a 40 day period, Jesus appeared to lots of different people at different times, different places, different sizes of groups. And these two bits of evidence, fulfilling what the Old Testament foretold and what Jesus himself foretold, they left those early followers utterly convinced that Jesus had been raised to life, so convinced that they were prepared to die for it. One of these appearances is recorded at the end of Luke's Gospel. I uh, would have got to it if we'd continued in our reading a little bit further in chapter 24. Jesus appeared among his disciples and they were scared stiff. They thought that they'd seen a ghost. But then Jesus does the ghost test and it's worth trying this out. So if you wake up in the middle of the night and you see someone at the foot of your bed, you're probably going to want to find out whether or not it's a ghost. How do you do it? Well, it's very simple. Uh, there are two simple tests. First test is the touch test. Yeah, so reach out and touch the person. And if your hand happens to hit up, up against something solid, against flesh and, blood and bone, well, that's not a ghost. Yeah, that, that's a living person. So if you were here, you could try it with me. You could, uh, you could poke me and see if I'm a ghost or not. And if there's someone next to you, maybe give them a bit of a poke now. Second test is the food test. So give them something to eat. And if it disappears uh, when it goes into their mouth, you can guarantee that that is not a ghost. So I thought I'd just try this uh, with you just to, to test it out. So here we are. I'm, an oat cake, Nan's oat cake, very nice indeed. And um, the thing is that ghosts don't have an esophagus, uh, they don't have intestines, they don't have a stomach. Um, but if it's a real person, when you eat something, it's going to disappear. Maybe a Nan's oat cake wasn't the best thing. Um, these are the tests that, <coughs> excuse me a second. Ah, that's better. These are the tests that Jesus got his disciples to do 
when he appeared to them when they thought that he was a ghost. So this is what he said to them. He said, touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. That's Luke 24, 39. And then he said to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. On Wednesday this past week, we had a lunchtime event online and the topic was, did the resurrection of Jesus really happen? And our speaker was Jeremy Cook or Mr. Justice Cook to give him his proper title. Um, he's a former High Court judge. And so he's well placed to examine evidence. Uh, that's his job. It's what he's done for a living, examining evidence. He shared with me that uh, for a short two week trial, you might have 20 to 25 lever arch files full of evidence that he needs to read through and assess. And he said that for a commercial case, a case between multinational companies, you're looking at 150 to 200 lever arch files. He says law is based on the premise that truth is discoverable from the evidence. He actually began his talk on Wednesday by eating a daffodil. He really did. It was a proper daffodil. Chomp, chomp, down it went. And he says this. He says, imagine going back to your flat and telling your flatmates that you've just seen a high court judge eat a daffodil. They might not believe you. But what if 20 or 500 people reported the same and they were people of integrity? The evidence, he says, is what people say they have seen and heard, and you need to evaluate it, look at contrary evidence and work out what is the most coherent explanation. That is precisely, he says, what we have to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Now, that's what he's done. And he is persuaded that the evidence points in only one direction, and that is that Jesus was raised to life. And raised forever. So Jesus said in our verse, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. The gospel accounts record Jesus raising a number of people from death to life, but all these people died again at some point. So at some point, they had a second funeral. But Jesus was raised forever. He defeated death. Perhaps think of it in terms of tennis. Uh, death is a world-class tennis player. He undefeated. So whoever he has played throughout history, it's been game, set and match to death. With people like Lazarus, um, whom Jesus raised to life, death lost a set but then he came back to win the game. But Jesus, in his resurrection, defeated death. He won. First time ever that death has lost. It seemed that, uh, that death had five set points, but then Jesus came back and he won the game. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. But what is the significance of Jesus winning that first century showdown with death? Well, it's hugely significant for who he is. The resurrection of Jesus proves Jesus' credentials, that he is the rescuer and he is the ruler that he claimed to be. Firstly, the ruler. Jesus said in our verse, I am the first and the last and the living one. The first and the last is a claim to have total power. So an A to Z of London is a map of London that contains all the streets from A to Z and everything in between. And so Jesus is the first and last of everything. So he's in control of the beginning and the end and everything in between. Now that is a big claim to make, but his resurrection proves it. Total power, even over death. The kind of power that only God has, the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last, Jesus said, and the living one. And again, that is God language. God is the living one. Extraordinary claims from a carpenter from a little northern town to make. But his resurrection says it's true. The resurrection declares Jesus to be the ruler 
the Lord. He was declared to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Romans 1, 4 says. And the resurrection declares Jesus to be the ruler who will judge everyone at the end of time, Acts 17 says. But it also proves that he is the, uh, the rescuer that he claimed to be. So Jesus taught that his death in our place would secure the forgiveness of our sins, that it was a sacrifice to pay for our wrongdoing. Well, how do we know that the payment went through? How do we know that it worked? How do we know that it was accepted by God the Father? Well, the resurrection is the proof. Maybe think of it like this, that when you um, make a card payment in a shop, uh, what do you do? Well, you, you swipe your card on the machine, at the checkout, at the till, but how do you know that your payment has gone through and has been accepted? Well, because the, rec the receipt comes out of the machine. And so Jesus coming out of the tomb is proof that his payment for sins went through. It was accepted. Imagine if I made uh, the kind of claims that Jesus did. Yeah, imagine if I said, now look, I've I've been meaning to say this to you for some time, but I'm actually the ruler of everything and the rescuer sent from heaven. You would say, how do we know? Uh, prove it. Imagine if I replied, well, look, I can't actually do anything different to you, but just trust me. By contrast, Jesus says, you want proof? I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Now that's pretty impressive. So Jesus' resurrection declares him to be the ruler and the rescuer that God has appointed. And it tells us also how he can help us today. So what difference does Jesus' victory over death back in the first century, what difference does it make for us today? When you read through the book of Acts in the Bible, the story of the early church, it's apparent that the the resurrection of, De of Jesus was a very big deal for those early Christians. It was clearly something that they were, were very excited about. And the reason was, it's a game changer. Look again at what Jesus said. He said, I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus has the keys of death. And Hades, or Sheol is a biblical term for the place of departed spirits. It's sometimes just translated the grave. So through his resurrection, Jesus has the keys of death. Now, it doesn't mean he's got an actual bunch of keys in his pocket, of course. It's a picture. It means that he has power over the realm of death. So death is a prison to which he has the keys. He can get us out of there. You see, keys give you power, don't they? they? They give you power to get into places. They give you power to get out of places. They unlock doors. Without the key, you're trapped. And so with death. Death is a prison to which we are heading. And none of us, has the, none of us has the key to get out. But Jesus does. Jesus is the key holder. And he's the only one. Um, you can't go into your local Timpson store and get a copy made. He alone has the keys. One day we are going to die. And there's only one person who can get us out of that prison. There's only one person who has the keys of death. Jim Rohn is a motivational guru whose philosophy has apparently helped millions of people to improve their business and their personal life and their leadership and their finances. I'm sure it's improved his own finances a little bit as well. One of his best-selling books is called The Keys to Success. Now that's fine, but that's not going to help any of us when we face death. If you were lying in the Nightingale Hospital, uh, would you be thankful if someone came round giving out copies of that book? We don't just need someone who can get us through life successfully. We need someone who can get us through death and bring us out into life on the other side. Well, Jesus has the keys. Maybe think of it this way. So think of um, 
think of death as being a black cloth. And in his resurrection, Jesus is like this needle uh, that is pierced through the black cloth and come out the other side. And the point is this, that if we trust in him, we are united with him and we are like thread in the needle. And so we will be pulled out with him through to the other side into life in God's eternal kingdom. What that means is that if we trust in Jesus, we don't need to fear death. Death has been conquered. Jesus begins our verse by saying, fear not. So he delivers us from the fear of death. Now, that isn't to say that you look forward to death. Um, speaking personally, I, I love my life and I've certainly no wish to die and to leave my family anytime soon. And the thought of dying strapped to a, a ventilator somewhere, strapped to a ventilator and distance from your loved ones, um, that's unimaginable. But the point is that the person who trusts in Jesus can have confidence in the face of death. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, David said in Psalm 23. But someone might say, they might say, well, to be honest, I'm not bothered about death. You know, when my time comes, it comes. And personally, someone might say, I think that's the end. And I'm fine with that. You know, I've had a good life. Trees die, they get recycled. Same with people. But Jesus tells us that death is not the end. Beyond death is judgment. And beyond that, what the Bible calls the second death. Ongoing existence, being shut out eternally from life with God. But Jesus' keys fit that door as well. So he has the power to save us not just from physical death, but from the eternal death of being sh shut out of God's kingdom in eternity. And so if we trust in him, we have nothing to fear from the coming judgment. Fear not, Jesus said. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, the Apostle Paul triumphantly declared. And that is why in the Christian calendar, today is party time. Easter Sunday, it's a celebration. The day death died. Conquered by Jesus. Game, set and match. And if we trust in him, we will share in his victory. If you've never done that, if you've never trusted in Jesus for yourself, why not do that today? And if we have, if we do trust in him, may today be a day of thanksgiving and of joy, even in the midst of these difficult times. Jesus said, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Well, let's pause for a moment to reflect on these wonderful words of Jesus and then the Ferguson family are going to lead us in our prayers. Father God, thank you that you raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you that you gave your one and only Son so that we can be called your children too. Thank you that his resurrection paves the way for us to have a new life with you, now and forever.
Thank you that this hope is sure and certain. We confess our need for you, fresh and new today. Please renew our hearts, minds and lives for the days ahead. Help us to trust in you. We pray for all who are facing death at the moment. Please help them to trust in Jesus' death and resurrection too. Please give them certainty that as they trust in Jesus' death and resurrection, there is great hope beyond the grave. Please give them confidence that you can raise them from death to life with you forever. And with this, give them peace today. We pray for those suffering ill health, for those who are worried or anxious at this time, and for those who have experienced loss. Lord, we pray they will receive the support and comfort that they need. Sustain medical staff and carers across this nation and the world. Thank you there is no pain you cannot conquer. Thank you that there is no hurt you cannot heal. Thank you that there is no life you cannot transform. Your death and resurrection proved that nothing is impossible for you. Father God, as one church, united under your holy headship, knowing that we are all one family in Christ, we pray for those who suffer in your name. Today we lift up our brothers and sisters in Sudan who share in the same great gift of salvation through your Son, but who face injustice, oppression, and even death because of their faith in you. We pray that you will grant them strength, courage, and protection from those who seek to harm them because of their faith. Guidance and wisdom for when their path seems impossible to tread, and hope for a future when they have the freedom to worship you without fear. God of peace, Equip our Pastor Marcus in every good thing, that he might know your will for our church at this time. Keep him and his family safe as they serve you and our community through this difficult time. By your resurrection power, may we, as a body of believers, make a difference in this world for your glory and purposes. May we reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and healing. Lastly, we pray for the readers, the leaders of every country around the world, and for all those in positions of authority, many of whom face difficult decisions. We pray that they would turn to you for guidance. Grant them wisdom, Lord, in decision-making, and we pray that they would know you as their Saviour. Today Today and and every day, day, help us us to fix fix our hearts and minds on you. you. Help us, Father, to live in the gladness and grace of Easter Sunday every day. For the glory of Jesus Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. It's finished. It's over. There's more of them than us and they look a lot bigger. The villain's got the girl and his fingers on the trigger. Voldemort, Sauron and Vader reign. It's gone to penalties against the Germans again. It's a terrible feeling when hope is erased, faith misplaced, virtue defaced, gloom embraced, reputation replaced with the taste of disgrace. When you've pushed every door and it's been slammed in your face, when you realise you're third in a two horse race. So come sit with me on Golgotha's slopes. See human history at its lowest ebb. See the forces of goodness and grace on the ropes. Evil had spoken, last rites read. In a phony gown and thorny crown, he's mocked and knocked and shamed. As he staggers down through an angry town, they spit and hit and hate. Hands that forged galaxies and flung starry trails are pierced and punctured by merciless nails. His body succumbing to brutal infliction. These, the horrors of crucifixion. And as dice are tossed, hope is lost. Desolate disciples count the cost. King of the Jews, his headrest embossed. A criminal's killing on Calvary's cross. And as last words cut through foul-smelling air, the whole of the cosmos cries out in despair. It is finished. It's over. But then.
then dawn breaks on Easter day, darkness quakes as shadows give way to the light. See, resurrection's the plan, it's why God sent him. And the comeback's on, there's a change of momentum. The powers of damnation in previous jubilation have been hushed and crushed by the Lord of creation. See, he takes the hit, stands where we should have stood, and that's why we call Friday good. And he's back with life and with us and blessed. And that's why we can know it as Sunday best. So to the four nil down, to the backs against the wall, listen to his rallying resurgent call. And to those up against it in brokenness and pain, Easter's story roars, we go again. So thine be the glory, death's lost its sting. Here's to Jesus, the comeback king. Something that is very striking in the biblical account is the transformation in the first disciples. So when Jesus died, they were full of fear and doubt and despair. But then the same people in the book of Acts are transformed. Uh, they're full of confidence and joy and hope. And the reason? Well, one verse in Acts says this. With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of of the Lord Jesus. Well, that same confidence can be ours this Easter time. As our final song says, once bound in fear, now bold in faith. To conquer every sting of death Sing, sing hallelujah For joy awaits as dawning light When Christ's disciples lift their eyes Alive he stands, their friend and king Christ, Christ he is risen is risen, is risen indeed. Oh, sing hallelujah. Join the chorus, sing with our redeemed. Christ is risen, is risen indeed. Where doubt and darkness once had been, they soar in men, their hearts believe that blessed are those who have not seen. He frees our hearts to live His grace. Go tell of His goodness. Christ is risen. His
Well, let's declare together these words on the screen. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In just a moment, there's a chance to meet on Zoom for a time of Q&A and to hang out together online. And the link will come up at the end and is also on the service sheet. But as we close, a prayer from Romans chapter 15. This Easter Sunday, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may abound in hope. Amen.